Welcome to Chapter 6 of the Cruise Planning, Cruise Selection section. In this section, we'll look at various things when considering the crew and an assignment of responsibilities. Let's get started. In this chapter, we're going to look at crew selection, crew preparation, considerations for family, guests, children, and pets, what are the expectations of the crew, some clothing to wear, eyewear, eyeglasses, bedding, and laundry, and then what some of the boat routines might be. Selection of the crew is one of the most important items when we're considering for, you know, uh, our crews. If we make bad choices, you know, each day the boat seems to get smaller and smaller as time goes on. And so we need to really look for compatible people. One of the places that you can look for compatible people People are people you already know, your friends. Um, you know, and there may be, you know, if, if you're like me and run out of friends real quick, then you might ask for some of your other people that for referrals, or or you know, there are some ways to post and get information uh, from club members. In some places, we actually even have a crew finder list. One of the things that you need to factor in is how many how many crew people are you going to need. If you have too many, the boats get overcrowded, and that makes can add tension. And if you have too few, then you're going to need to have a very experienced crew to cover multiple roles. Before the cruise, we want to we we'll look at also what setting some of the expectations with our crew. For example, do we expect them to help out in different tasks on board? Are they going to pay their own way? Who is going to get the supplies? Who picks up the bar tab and, and restaurant tabs and things like that? We also have our Match.com process that we use uh, for you know matching up crews that don't haven't already uh, made those arrangements. In this case, we're we're really looking at uh, personality type compatibility, uh, food preferences. Uh, different, you know, and different things. Many of you have already completed our Match.com survey, and if you haven't already completed it, we'll want you to get that in pretty quick because that's one of the key factors for us when we're assigning uh, people to boats. This slide is brought to you by the Power Squadron Attorneys to remind everybody that the the coal regs, the regulations, state that. Everybody on board has to follow the rules and are responsible for them. On each boat, we'll have a designated captain, uh, the, the lead skipper, let's say. And they're, they're responsible for the whole boat, really, because it's their credit cards that's on file if anything serious gets needs to be taken care of. What I encourage everybody to do when we're looking, you know, when we're down in the BVIs, is to actually have everybody go through the crew briefing on the boat to kind of understand uh, where, what everything is doing and how it all works. For example, there is so much information that the, the shore team trains you on as we get started as part of our briefing that the more people that listen to it, the more things that are likely going to be remembered. For example, where are the where are the fire extinguisher? Where's the what's the nav table? How do you test the the tank leanings? Where are the where are the Y valves for the plumbing? Um, and how do you start the engine? How do you run the chart plotter? All those things. The more people that have gone through the the briefing, the better chance you have that you'll be able to remember how to do it when when it's your turn to do it. I also encourage everybody to take the you know, to practice some things before you get into a real difficult situation. Um, we also have, a, a, as part of a, you know, our, our boats, when we're working with the, the Moorings and Sunsail Company, for those people that haven't gone out or don't have a lot of experience, we have an option where we, they call it to, you know, to have a friendly skipper, uh, which, kind of, which is a person from the moorings that is familiar with the boat and, and they can go out for a half day with you in addition to your boat briefing and they'll take you out sailing, show you how to raise the sails, how to run the engine, 
how to do all the various systems in a, in a you know, on the water type scenario. So if you're interested in one of those things, let me know and we'll make sure that we include that in our, in our agreement with the, the contract people. Often when we're looking at crew, uh, we, we can look to our families as being the first selection criteria for uh, joining us on a boat. I find that's nothing more satisfying than be able to go sailing with, you know, with my family uh, to share the fun that I have. There are, you know, there are other s situations that also have to, you know, family dynamics that sometimes come into play that you have to also consider. We also have, you know, the, the you know, distinction between guests versus crew. If you have a true guest where you're not expecting them to really participate in anything other than just enjoy the cruise, uh, you are the host and it's your job to essentially provide a uh, pleasurable experience for them. When we have children on board, we also have some factors we need to consider. Safety, safety is really an important item. Uh, we certainly would like to get them involved depending upon their age and, and you know, the more things we can do that involve them, the more fun they're going to have. But one of the other factors we be, need to be sure is that when young people are on boat, on deck, they, they need to have a life jacket and wear their life jacket uh, to ensure their safety. Through our Match.com process, we're hopefully being able to identify and group together people that are compatible. Uh, and so there's not a lot of hierarchical needs uh, that we have to employ. Uh, but the, uh, the lead skipper is responsible, and so they want to make sure that for this, they're responsible for the safety of the boat as well as the crew. But it's not an autocratic system where they need to work with the people on board to make sure that everybody is, uh, has the same point of view or the same objectives. We haven't really had much of a problem with this. Probably the biggest problem we've ever encountered is some people want to sleep late and other people want to get up early. And so there's just some common courtesy that needs to be, you know, given to each of the crew members. If you, if you sleep too late, you're not going to be able to make it to a mooring. And so that's one of the issues that uh, causes some conflict on board. Crew space is really limited. That's one of the factors that's really a big problem for us on these little boats. Big, you know, it's a 40-foot boat, for goodness sake. But when we get done bringing all our stuff, there really isn't enough space for everything. So we really need to put things away, you know, do the dishes when they're, you know, after, after meals, get them all put away, you know, stowing the gear where they belong. This is probably the hardest thing that I have to deal with when I'm crewing. You ask anybody in my family, it's like, Jerry, put stuff away when you're done with it. Because it, it, it always comes down to when I get ready to, uh, where's my USB charger for my phone? Where's the camera? Where's my GPS? Uh, I'm just not very good at putting things back when I finish. We'll also want to you know, have a plan for uh, conserving water. Uh, the boats don't have a lot of water. There'll be two tanks on board. We look at the first tank and we run that one dry and then say, okay, we still have another tank to get us to the next filling station. Uh, and there are various places in the BVIs that we can you know, fill up. Waste management, we've got you know, our sanitation officer who gets all the, the, the heads all arranged with the valves in the right position when we're in the harbor and out of harbor. In addition, we've got you know, trash on board. We're gonna you know, we'll create a lot of garbage. And so we'll have to deal with that. Uh, sometimes we're able to take it and put it in a dumpster on shore. Uh, sometimes, you know, that would be like at Leverick Bay. Um, Kane Garden Bay has a dumpster. I think there might be one in, you know, Eos Van Dyke. We just, uh, we, we drop stuff in their dumpster. Deliverance, which is a boat that goes from boat, you know, harbor to harbor. And they have uh, ice, ice cream alcohol and also take care of the trash you can you know for a dollar or two they they'll, you, they'll take your trash bag for the day and you can give it to them and they can deal with it entertainment is also a factor the the christmas method for for cruising is to pack as much things into our time as we can so we have a lot of planned activities now other people are looking for more for just 
I want to sit on the shore, get a suntan, relax, and listen to the beach. And so everybody has to factor that into their, uh, into their trip too. We're going to talk about clothing in a lot more detail down the road, what to pack. But we generally use um, a checklist of things that are important. But remember, you know, one of the factors is there's about six inches of closet space in each one of the cabins where you can hang your stuff up. You got about maybe one or two drawers to put things in that are uh, very small. You'll probably want to have some short clothes. We're not talking uh, uh, ties and jackets. We're talking uh, perhaps a, a polo shirt and shorts. Uh, boat clothes are things that quickly dry. Foul weather gear is probably going to be on the boat already. Uh, if you want your own personal foul weather gear, I think one time I brought some of my own because, uh, and I thought that would have been a good thing. You know, boat shoes are important, and then, uh, you know, other factors that apply. If you wear eyeglasses, you may want to bring a backup pair in case they get knocked overboard. Need to have sunglasses uh, because the sun is really, really high in the sky and it is very, you know, very bright. Uh, I, I usually, when I'm racing, like to wear polarized sunglasses because that helps me take the glare off the, of the water and I can see the wind on the water a little better. Unfortunately, the polarized Sunglasses do, are not really well compatible with the chart plotter, so you have the, the glare off the chart plotter and the polarization in the sunglasses make it difficult to see. So uh, I probably will have a non-polarized pair of glasses so that I can read the chart plotter better. Now the boats that we have have all you know bedding and you know sheets and towels and things like that for us to use, so we don't really have to worry about that too much. One of the things that I, that was one of my mentors said was, when you go to get, when you're taking a shower in the harbor before when you get your boat, just bring that towel that you get out of the, you know, the, the, at the, at the, from the shower area, just bring that bit back with you so you have an extra towel to throw down uh, for picking up sand or work, taking it ashore. We probably won't need to do laundry. There, there are some places that you could if you need to. Um, in Soper's Hole, we used to have a place there that would do laundry. It was not very expensive if you run out of clothes. But generally, that's not a factor in our trip that we need to worry about. Establishing a routine on board is really, you know, it makes the cruise a lot more fun, I think. Uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done. And we'll throw over my my methods for uh, assigning tasks to the crew and that routine on the next slide. There are also things that we also need to consider is, okay, what, what, what are our meals? Like in our household, we need to have, you know, we typically have breakfast at 7.30, lunch at 12, dinner at 6, give or take 10 minutes. And so if that's your st style, then you'll need to establish that on your boat. Uh, typically, when we're down at the in the BBIs, we're 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 in vacation mode a little bit, and our meal plan goes for something like this: we make breakfast in the morning uh, with coffee, and then you know get the dishes cleaned up, and then make a sandwich for lunch before we leave the harbor, and then we have that sandwich ready to pull out of the you know free, uh, fridge whenever we we get hungry if if we haven't made other plans for stop at a restaurant along the way. Then at dinner time, we'll plan for uh, going ashore to the restaurant in our next harbor and have a you know group, me group meal with everybody else in our flotilla. And so that, that, that'll, that'll generally be, you know, we'll have reservations made. And if you decide that you don't want to have meals with us on our flotilla, then we'll need to know that in advance because we usually confirm the number of reservations early in the morning so the restaurant can be ready for us. Generally, we're going to have probably around 40 people in our flotilla, and so that sort of taxes the capacity of some of the restaurants on our islands. And so we'll probably take over most of the restaurant, you know, most of the seating in some of the restaurants when we are sitting in there. So it kind of makes it kind of fun in that regard. Cruising watches, you know, we're just, you know, 
our cruises, our trips between islands are so short that we really don't have to worry about long watches. Everybody's just sort of um, on board. But if you were to on a cruise from like uh, Miami to the Bahamas, for example, you might need to take a break, you know, sail for a couple hours, rest, turn the crew over and turn the responsibility over to the other, to the next team and let them sail for a few hours while they rest. It's just a way to break up the, you know, give you a break on the stuff. Here's my typical approach for dealing with crews, and it allows for everybody to get uh, a chance to try different things. So we've, you know, the helmsmen of the day, they're the ones that are driving the boat, operating the engine and things like that. And, you know, you know decision making along the way what needs to be done. We also have the, uh, the role of a helmsman assistant. He was likely the navigator of the day. And then tomorrow will be the helmsman. Uh, so, for, so that if he's assisting the helmsman of the day, then he can kind of see how it's done and learn from the current helmsman. And then by being the navigator of the day, the navigator is the person that actually plots the course, set the waypoints, and decided how we're going to get from our current harbor to our next harbor. Navigator assistant is the one that's learning how to, you know, watching the navigator as they enter the data into the chart plotter, double checking the, the coordinates and the paths to make sure they're safe that the navigator is done. The bowman, the bow person, up in the bow is the one that handles the picking up the mooring ball, releasing the mooring ball, uh, and things like that. The bow person assistant is the one that helps them with uh, you know all the stuff that's going on. So you know, hanging on to the boat hook, uh, assisting with lines and tying up and things like that. And then also double checking to make sure that the boat is secure when when they're all done. Sanitation officer, I is um, the person that actually does checks the plumbing and does the Y valves on each one of the heads to make sure that they're in the proper position based upon which where we are. So for example, the sanitation officer would close the, the Y valve uh, when we're going into a harbor. And then when we get out in open water, they would open up the Y valve to, to, to drain the tanks out so that we're ready to put more into it in, later in the day. Our safety officer is the person that's responsible for making sure that everything is, that we're operating a safe operation. For example, uh, they might make the call for when to put on life jackets, when to reef, uh, to make sure, you know, to watch for um, uh, storms that might be coming on, identifying where the, the fire extinguishers are, and things like that. The galley slave is the cook of the day. And they're the ones that are uh, planning our meals for that day to help, you know, with with assistance um, and making meals for breakfast and, and lunch and then clean up. We also, when we're on my boat, you know, after we've picked up the mooring ball at the end of the day, we're likely going to have a snack at that point. We might have some snacks set aside, too, to uh, provide uh, for uh, some some nourishment while we're under sail. These things are, you know, are quick and easy, like a uh, granola bar or something like that. When we put the mooring, when we're hooked up, then we might have a little more interesting snack, like a fruit, you know, a cheese and cracker tray or something to go along with our celebratory beverage when we're done. Now we already talked a little bit about what the captain is. The captain's responsibility for the boat, and that's sort of the we, I, I think of it as a captain of the day. And the captain of the day then is also um, making decisions. As, do we need to make a stop and things like that? What, what, what uh, intermediate stops along the way? Now, on our boat, the captain of the day can be overruled by the admiral, and that would be my job. And so uh, that one doesn't rotate the admiral. Uh, and that's how we handle our boat. We also have the role for dinghy captain, and that is the person that's in charge of managing the dinghy for the day. This would be making sure that it, the line, the painter line, bow line is pulled up tight uh, when we come into the harbor for picking up a mooring ball, as well as starting the engine uh, and, and such as that. Th this technique allows the sharing of the workload so that no one is stuck doing an unpleasant task for the entire trip. 
as well as everybody gets to participate in the fun stuff. However, if crew, if crew members ha have difficulty with a task and, and they're no longer having fun, they can delegate their responsibilities to another willing crew member. An example of this would be we were sailing out in the open Atlantic you know, in, in heavy seas and there was a squall line coming in our direction. The boat wasn't handling very well. It was not steering well. So Kim was getting frustrated and wasn't having any fun. So then she turned it over to someone else who was more interested and more, you know, willing to tackle the, you know, driving the boat in big waves. I took over and my, I had fun because I was trying to get that big boat to plane down the waves, surf down the waves, which was pretty cool. This concludes Chapter 6, Crew Selection. We'll go over the homework questions as well as answer any questions that you may have in our next live session.